Juan Romero, so nice to meet you all. So some of you I know. Uh, I am an associate professor at the University of Maine, so I work mainly on silage, hay, on the inoculant side, preservatives. So that has been my work throughout these years. So we're right now conducting research, for instance, to, to demonstrate that alfalfa needs more preservatives than grasses when you're producing hay, high moisture hay. So, but today I'm going to be talking about the, the foundations, right? The, basically the good management practices that we should implement before even thinking about using preservatives and inoculants because those products are going to just yes, help us, but they're not going to address any management issue that, that should be implemented and is recommended at a nationwide level. So, so today I'm going to be focusing on those good management practices. And if there is uh, maybe another opportunity, I will talk about inoculants and preservatives. I have a bunch of slides on that too. So, but I, indeed, if you have any questions about inoculants and preservatives, I'm more than welcome to answer them during the uh, an questions and answer session, okay? So, but this is not hmm. Okay, now it should work. So, this slide is going to summarize everything I'm going to be talking about today. So, first, we need to have a rapid air removal. And this basically means that we need to pack rapidly and we need to pack to at least 14 pounds of dry matter per cubic feet, which is the bare minimum that should be achieved. So in order to be able to achieve that rapid air removal, because otherwise we're going to affect the other two corners. So uh, the second one being rapid acidification. So for us to be able to, to achieve rapid acidification, we need to have a rapid air removal because the microbes are going to acidify, they are anaerobic. They don't like oxygen. They like to be in anaerobic conditions. So they're only going to start producing the acids once the air is out. So if the air is still in, what you're going to have are the yeast and molds, so which are going to be pretty undesirable, right? Any other aerobic bacteria too that may be around. So the rapid acidification is going to be crucial for legumes and grasses and mixtures. So we want basically that high, that high concentration of protein to be preserved adequately so we don't have to buy as much soybean meal. So for that, we need to acidify fast. And the third one is the rapid feed out, which before in the 90s, 80s, and before that, it was not something that was paid too much attention to. So the fermentation part was basically where most, most people will pay attention to, including the salish scientists. But recently, we know that feed out phase is very crucial. So as you can see in this graph, if we do, don't do a good job at managing the feed out phase, we can have huge losses. So all phases are going to potentially cause huge losses, but the feed out phase can be really catastrophic, right? So and it's especially, could be especially bad for a corn silage because corn silage ferments very well. It's one of the easiest crops to ensile, but once you open that silage, there is not enough acetic acid, boom, you know, like that things can go south really fast. So the fermentation and storage phase also is very important. We need to pay close attention to it if we want to preserve the quality of the proteins of our, our, of our forage crop and we want to buy less protein supplements. So that's going to be really crucial. But this should be able to guide you in terms of what, how, much, how many dry matter losses are tolerable. But let me warn you that these dry matter losses, although it's very, very informative, is only got giving us the big picture because actually it's not considering the nutrient profile because the microbes, those guys are quote unquote smart. So they're going to go first for the most nutritive portions of the diet, meaning the sugars, meaning the soluble proteins, those are going to be selected first. So it's like a, in a store, kids go to the candies first, right? So that's basically what they're going to go and they're going to leave the fiber behind. So they're going to not only cause a decrease in dramatic loss, but also the nutritive value is going to decrease too, which is going to be basically a double hit to our operation and our profits. So fortunately, the USDA has developed models, although these are only based on dramatic losses, right, to kind of understand us what is the economic impact of these dramatic losses. So this is expressed on dollars per pound of dry matter, and this example is with, with corn silage, right? 5% is going to be very good, 5% shrink, that's also actually going to be good management. But if we end up having 15% shrink losses, 
we actually, that 10% unit increase, so 5 to 15, is going to result in 12% increase in our cost of producing that corn silage. So those are basically real numbers of the economic impact that our management decisions are going to have in terms of our profitability, because it means now we need to buy more corn meal, we need to buy more soybean meal, depending, well, if we were using an example of, of a grass silage or a legume silage, then those are going to be uh, impacts that now we have to buy more supplements in order to be able to compensate for those losses. And all that money that was invested in terms of fertilization, pesticide application, so seed cost, harvest cost, so all of that is going to be basically affected. So all that good effort, right? So in terms of the harvest, one of the first decisions that we have to make and one of the most important ones is about at what maturity we need to harvest. But this is something that has been discussed thoroughly. So these are the, the, the best recommendations that are available. So across the country in terms of at what maturity state we should harvest each, each type of forage crop, but corn silage is special. So corn silage, we should be actually focusing on the dry matter. So that milk line thing, that's something that was in, done in the past, but now is proven to have poor correlation with modern hybrids. So we have to be careful with using the milk line. It's kind of a rough reference, but our actual decision on when to harvest should be based on dry matter. So, and before basically it was recommended that between 32 to 35% dry matter was going to be the best dry matter to harvest corn silage. So to maximize our animal performance, but actually like lately, so there is that are able to manage diseases in the crop, in the corn crop, so they're able to have kernel processing scores above 70%, meaning that they're going a thorough job at processing those kernels. And also there is our packing to at least 14 pounds of dry matter per cubic feet. Now they can start thinking about, hey, you know, my corn meal is super expensive, those costs, I want to reduce them. So I want to have more starch coming from my own corn silage. So the only way that that, that can be achieved is going to be if we increase the dry matter of that corn silage. So we now are thinking about 36 to 38% dry matter, which before was thought to be too dry because then it's going to be harder as, for us to pack, but also that starch digestibility is going to decrease because yes, you're going to have more starch, but now that the starch digestibility is going to decrease because that starch is more crystalline. So that is why it's very important for us to do a proper job at doing the kernel processing, but because drier silages are harder to pack, so now we have to do also a thorough job at packing. So we need to be more, uh, uh, we, we need to do a better job at being able to achieve at least 14 pounds of, uh, that, sorry, 14, yes, 14 pounds of dry matter per cubic feet, okay? So that's a side comment I wanted to make with corn silage because this is something that, that is recently being discussed, but I think it's very important in an area like Maine where we have to import our corn meal, so then, being able to produce more starch is going to be very useful, but we need to do it the right way because as I'm going to show you in the next slides, if we don't pack well, so if we don't do proper kernel processing, we're going to actually be in a worse situation. There is a reason why in the past it was recommended to harvest corn between 32 to 35 because in the past, so, uh, so basically because this is a safer choice because if you, the more you dry, the harder it's going to be for you to be able to pack that side. So as we decrease the particle size, it's going to be easier for us to pack, but we need to consider rumination uh, requirements, right? So, and these are the recommendations that are, have been provided for many years. So basically for anything that is not kernel processed corn, for grasses, legumes, and unprocessed corn, to chop to three eighths to half an inch is going to be basically an adequate balance between the needs for rumination and the needs for packing. But nowadays, there are recent recommendations from the Miner Institute. So in terms of that particle size, so, and that's something that should be worked out with your nutritionist in order to uh, see basically that fine balance between subacute acidosis, the potential of that being a problem in your herd and how much uh, chopping you're actually doing on your forage, right? So that, that is a fine balance. This is kind of like the safe recommendation, safe recommendation, but there are newer ones that actually kind of pushing the line but subacute acidosis should be something that we should be keeping in mind if we are thinking about even smaller particle sizes, okay? So for being able to achieve this 
I think that one thing that is often overlooked is to sharpen our knives. So to do that proper maintenance to the harvester and to, to do a, a, a thorough job and making sure that the feed out, sorry, the feeding role of the harvester is going to be rotating at the speeds are going to be necessary to be able for us to be able to achieve those theoretical lengths of cuts because that's a setting in the machine. So actually that's machine dependent. So you you are the one that should be setting that PLC in terms of uh, um, relative to that machine uh, and it's basically uh, the recommendations by the manufacturer in terms of how to be able to achieve that. So for, uh, for kernel processed corns, because the kernel processing itself is going to reduce the particle size further. So the recommendations for the theoretical le length of cut are actually going to be a bit bigger. It's going to be three fourths of an inch. So that's the, the traditional recommendation. But if we were to harvest corn silage above 70% moisture, then kernel processing is risky in terms of increasing the chances for effluence. But that's very unlikely, right? I doubt like because of the sacrifice of the starch that would mean for you to harvest it above 70% moisture, that actually is something that has happened to, some, to, a, to an extent that is frequent here in, in the US. Because ideally we want to harvest that corn silage drier so then we can get more starch, right? So in terms of, uh, of quality control for kernel processors, so we need to make sure that that gap between the rolls is between one to three millimeters and that all the kernels are going to be split in half or smaller chunks. So, and there are more refined ways to be able to assess the kernel processing, like the kernel processing score. So, but that's something that, that unfortunately we don't have time to discuss now, but you should have a kernel processing score above 70%. So meaning that more than 70% of the SAR should pass a screen that is around four millimeters in diameter. So cutting height, these are recommendations. I don't want to go too deep onto this because otherwise we're going to run out of time, but for different type of forages, the idea being if you, the lower you mow, the more soil that you're going to get on the crop, the, for the species that are going to be perennials, we're going to affect their persistence, right? So there is a limit on how low we can go, especially for grasses. So legumes can tolerate a close shaving to almost zero. So uh, if the stand is healthy, only if the stand is healthy, alfalfa can tolerate that. But other forage crops or a perennial forage crops are not going to be able to tolerate that and usually their stubble height should be like around three inches. So in the case of corn, so what we see is like if you have a problem with nitrate toxicity because of drought, so there are recommendations in terms of being able to increase that cutting height to avoid the part of the plant that is going to be high in nitrates. So other people also think about harvesting corn with a higher stubble height if they want to increase digestibility, but you will be sacrificing yield, right? So it has to be a balance between yield, quality, and the susceptibility of your soil to end up in, in, in your crop. So especially a problem for sandy soils relative to other types of soils. So now if we review the recommendations of filling rates of, for different type of silos or different type of crops that were developed by Dr. Buckmaster in Purdue. So we can see that those ranges uh, are going to differ across these type of silos and these type of crops. And they're going to be affected by Basically, we're, the, our ability to be able to achieve that is going to depend on our harvester output and the number of transporters that we're going to have available. So fortunately, Dr. Borgmaster has developed equations that can help us to decide actually the exact number of transporters that we're going to need for a given target, right, for, of harvest. So, but if you want to have a more complete picture in terms of the harvester output, that you need to have for a given fill out rate that you want to achieve. And the number of transporters are people associated with all of that operation. So Purdue University has an Excel that basically can help you making those decisions. So I uh, encourage you to check that, uh, that material, that Excel and see where you are in terms of your harvest goals. So all of this is basically the idea of coordinating the logistics of harvest is for us to be able to seal that forage in less than one day, which is super hard, right, to achieve. So typically this is going to take longer than this. So depending on, on the availability of equipment and labor and so on, right? But the advantage of doing it in less than one day is that we are going to be able to control the spoilage early on. So especially heating. So if you, when you are filling your silo, you are feeling that the silo is warm. So, so 
is going to the, the temperature is above room uh, above ambient temperature that means that there is going to be a problem with heating that is going to affect the digestibility of the protein because now we are more likely to have the mylar reaction and increasing that acid detergent insoluble crude protein that is indigestible protein but also part of the protein is going to be broken down to non-protein nitrogen which is going to be of less value for our dairy cows okay so usually with the forages we manage we typically are providing more of this rumen degradable protein that actually we need to provide our cows so that's going to end up in urine and that's going to contaminate the soil but importantly it's going to be a waste of nitrogen coming out of the cow right so all of this uh, coordination of logistics in terms of filling that silo fast so are we the ultimate goal of shortening that uh, um, packing period so we are able to be closer to sealing that silo around one day. So in terms of deciding how many tractors you're going to need to pack, that's going to depend on the weight of the tractors. So as you can see in this equation, so this is something that was developed for us to be able to make that decision in terms of the tractor combined weight that we will have available for the silo packing. So, and the number of tractors that we have, if we put those numbers, then that equation will be able to tell us what is the filling rate that we can actually achieve, right? So in this example, for instance, so we, for, with 48,000 pounds of combined tractor weight, we're going to be able to achieve a filling rate of 60 tons per hour, which is going to be below any of the optimal filling rates that Dr. Buckmaster suggests. So, and that is why ideally we want to increase the weight of our tractors, adding ballast, so uh, getting as heavier tractors as possible. So, and also to try to, to get as many tractors as is safe to have during that packing period, because also we have to consider safety to avoid accidents. If we have too many tractors, it's going to be a high chance to have any accidents while doing that packing. So these are important equations that can help us make those decisions. So in terms of like, if we make up our mind and we really want to do follow this chart and we want to follow those optimal rates. So this equation can also help us to decide or to be able to identify how many combined tractor weight we're going to need. So in this example, if our filling rate or target goal is 150 tons per hour, so then we're going to need a combined tractor weight of 120,000 pounds. So, and that's something that can help us decide and plan better in terms of how many tractors we're going to get, how many are, are going to be safe to have on that uh, silo. So uh, that's going to be very useful information for us to be able to achieve those packing densities that I was talking about for at least 14 pounds of dry matter per cubic feet. So for a bunker silo, if we want to, be as efficient as possible in terms of filling that bunker silo. This is something that the USDA has already worked on and has developed guidelines in terms of how to do that packing. So what is recommending is to have this progressive wedge type of filling approach for a bunker silo. So we know more than 33% slope because that's going to facilitate the packing and it's also going to prevent accidents to happen. So, so Keeping an eye on that slope is going to be very important, but also the USDA study the thickness of the layers that need to be spread when you are doing the packing. So, and ideally we want to spread layers that are no thicker than four inches and under any scenario, thicker than six inches. So basically with those, you're going to be maximizing the energy that is spent packing those layers because it's going to be impossible to pack the material once we put all the material on and we think that we're going to be then packing after at the end. So that's going to be impossible. Uh, uh, that's not going to be helpful in terms of allowing us to achieve those 14 pounds of matter per cubic feet. So what has been demonstrated is that we spread these thin layers, then we are actually going to be able to efficiently achieve that those densities and we're not going to be wasting money. So in terms of that packing uh, strategy. So for pile silos, the slopes need to be even smaller, less than 25% slope for us to be able to pack that material adequately so and prevent all the dry matter losses that we have been talking about. So this is a survey of different silos in the US. But what, interest, what is interest, in, interesting to me is that you see like on average, 
the densities that are reported for haylage and whole crop, whole crop corn silage are about 14 pounds of dry matter per cubic feet. But interesting, when I have visited farms in, in, in New England and I actually conducted samples, take, talking samples to assess the density of silo, I never seen a, si a grass silo in New England that is that has been able to reach at least 14 pounds of dry matter per cubic feet. I will say that on average, probably what I see is around 10. And I have seen as low as eight. So, and that's going to have huge consequences in terms of how much material you are losing during the fermentation and also during feed-out rate, as I'm going to show you, right? So if we keep it in mind that this is from 1999, so and that which is the last time somebody did a survey like this, and we were talking about many silos across the country, and we see that the average, on average, they're achieving those densities. It means that actually then we should be trying to make sure that the grass silos are going to reach those densities to avoid losses during storage. Fortunately, when I have sampled corn silages in the New England area, those silages I have seen that they, they can reach 14. I have seen 14 and above. If the problem is what I see is mostly with the grass silages. So, and also with the dry matter of the grass silages tends to be quite low. So if we are talking about wilting to at least 35% for grass silages, like you can see here, so what I typically see in the New England area is below 30, like 20, 22, 25. So which is going to cause a lot of trouble in terms of having undesirable microbes breaking or silages, silage nutrients, the best nutrients, increasing butyric acid, increasing the non-protein nitrogen fraction. And that butyric acid is going to decrease the intake of our animals. So it's going to even potentially cause or increase the chances of the animals to have ketosis because that butyric acid will transform to beta hydroxybutyrate, which is a ketone body. So those are things that we need to keep in mind. Okay, so that is why it's very important that for our grass and legume silages, we try to get at least about 30%, ideally to 35%, and that shouldn't take more than one day of wilting. So, so that's something that is important for us to keep in mind, okay? So the other thing that is important to mention is that has already been demonstrated that there is going to be a return of investment if we actually line the silo walls with plastic. So if you see this picture here, you can see that this example, the wall is not lined with plastic, right? So we can see, obviously, that there is a spoilage right next to the wall. So, but this is the tip of the iceberg. You know, what we see here is the mylar reaction, so that browning reaction. So it got so hot that actually the silo got cooked. So, and now basically that material is waste, basically. So, but actually the spoilage has penetrated already probably a couple of feet within. And this material here, even though you cannot perceive it visually, the nutrient profile is going to be worse. But you actually line the walls. So it has been demonstrated that there will be a return of investment actually lining those walls. So, because you're not only reducing the dry matter losses, but also the uh, nutrient profile is being preserved. So the, the strategy of how to be able to, to achieve that at least 14 pounds of dry matter per cubic feet depends on the packing intensity, on the moisture concentration of that silo, on the particle size. So it's a very complex, very complex set of decisions that we need to make. So University of Wisconsin has developed actually another Excel. Yes, I know, another Excel. So that is available. For, uh, for us to be able to actually check out our own situation and self-diagnose in terms of where we are in, 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 and what we things we can do in terms of improving our densities, okay? So I was telling you already many times that 14 is the bare minimum. So because it has been modeled that with 14 pounds of dry matter per cubic feet, you are going to have a dry matter loss of around 16% during an uh, installing period of 180 days. But actually, so dairies that are doing an optimal job in terms of packing, they're going to be close to 20. So we're talking levels of dramatic losses during storage below 13%. And this is only during storage. This is low, dramatic losses only during storage. We're not even talking about the losses during feed up. Okay. So, and I added in the slides, I know that Len is telling me we're running out of time. So some examples about the economic impact of this density decision, right? So if we pack at 10 versus we pack at 20, how much money we're losing. So I will encourage you to check these numbers and use your own numbers maybe to, 
to see where you are in terms of your losses. So the ceiling is very important because the silos are going to breathe in and breathe out air during the course of the day because they will get warm during the day, but they will get cold during the night. So our job is to restrict the movement of air as much as possible. So we need to get good quality plastics. So there are many recommendations regarding that. I already mentioned you about the benefits of doing a proper management of the, of the ceiling of the plastics are used in terms of the profitability of the operation. So, but only when all the points that I have been mentioned in our achieve, then you should be thinking about using an oxygen barrier field. Because I have seen many times that the densities are like around 10, but then the silo has an oxygen barrier on top of it. That's not going to solve anything. So we only think about inoculants and oxygen barrier films once we're able to achieve the average suggested management practices that I mentioned here in terms of dry matter, in terms of density, in terms of particle size, and so on. So the feed out phase, and with this, I believe I will, I will have to finish in this part. So it's very important, as I was mentioned, right? So there are recommendations in terms of how long to ensile for corn. It makes perfect sense to wait like four months because then you're going to be maximizing the starch stability, just letting your corn silage sit in there. That was something that was discovered maybe a few years ago. So in terms of what is the optimal siding length for corn silage and maximizing that starch digestibility. But what is important in terms of once we open that silo is to remove at least, at least six inches per day. So at least six inches per day, and in the summer it should be at least 12 inches per day. If we don't do that, basically we are burning for money because we're going to have massive losses in terms of uh, dry matter losses during the feed out phase, as I show you. Because once that silo is unsealed, then the geese and moles are going to grow on the surface, okay? So, and corn and sorghum are going to be very susceptible to losses to the, during the feed out phase. So that's something that we, we want to keep in mind. That is why I encourage people to use inoculants with lactobacillus buchneri during the feed out phase because it helps to have that acetic acid. So have at least like 3% acetic acid is going to be very useful in order to control those losses during feed out. Otherwise, as you can see, there are negative correlations between milk yield and yeast count in this example. So it's, there is a very clear impact on the productivity of your animals. Keeping a smooth silo phase, very important. We don't want to have phases like this because this is a surface, more surface area for the microbes to colonize. While if we keep a smooth phase, then there is less air penetration. Also to keep our silo phases as small as possible is very important. So relative to what we need. So because the less that is exposed to the air, the better. Right, So there is less likeliness of the moles and yeast to be able to colonize. Otherwise, we are going to have situations like this. So a silo phase that is full of moles that is going to have temperatures that can reach 50 degrees Celsius, which is pretty bad. That means that, that there is going to be a lot of mold activity there and the protein quality is going to be completely ruined. And we're not even talking about mycotoxins, which is what the next presenter is going to talk about. Glenda, am I... Uh, Two minutes more? Okay, good. So, so see these graphs, basically, and this is, a very, this is a simplistic graph because as you're going to see, this is, this is very complex. So with six inches being removed per day, or their mother losses are going to decrease, right? The more that we remove from the face, the better, but this is compounded with density. So, oh no, this is the, uh, let me see. Yeah, with density here. So these are the densities here are on, on a fresh basis. Here I transform it to a dry mother basis. So, but you can see if our silos are not packed well, our losses during feed out, if we don't remove at least six inches per day, are going to be even worse. So we have a compounded problem now. So if we don't do good packing, that's going to affect our feeding losses too, okay? Especially if we don't remove at least six inches or 12 inches per day, as I told you that it should happen during the summer. And this is basically where, where you can see the effect of temperature. So if we increase that temperature, during the season, we are, can see that when we get to temperatures that are closer to the summer, so we need to increase, we need to double that feed out rate. So it needs to go from six to 12 inches per day. So in order for us to be able to minimize those losses during feed out, okay? The rest of the slides are suggestions for, for me. You can consult that with your nutritionist. So in terms of target pHs, you can self-diagnose your own silos. 
in terms of the ammonia nitrogen that you should be having in, in, in your silos. And sometimes these are expressed on, in, in as crude protein, uh, uh, as, as percentage of crude protein uh, in, uh, let me remember how, there are some companies that express the acid detergent soluble. Oh no, this is ammonia nitrogen, right? So these, these are, there are some companies that will express this in different ways. I'm trying to remember right now, but most of them will present as ammonia nitrogen, okay? So you can use this as a percentage of nitrogen. So to be able to diagnose if you are having too much, uh, too much ammonia nitrogen being generated from your silos. So the acetic acid, so uh, on a fresh basis should be at least 8.8%, but on a dry matter basis for a typical corn silage should be at least 3%. Right, because this point eight is for fresh is on a fresh basis. On a dry mother basis, it should be at least three percent for the typical dry mother that we have in corn silages. With that, I will stop here. So the rest you can actually check in terms of butyric acid, how much you have in your silos. So an ethanol too. So ethanol actually is quite undesirable because this is the product of yeast fermentation. It means that we are having quite a bit of losses. So if we have high concentration of ethanol, and the way you can tell that is by the sweet smell. So actually a lot of people think that sweet smell is correlated with lactic acid, but that lactic acid doesn't have any smell. So that the sweet smell actually is coming from the ethanol and the ethanol reacting with the acetic acid. So that's actually what is generating that sweet smell. So a lactic acid actually does not have any smell. So good, okay. So, well, I am, uh, I thank you for, uh, I thank you for, for the opportunity to present to you. And I apologize if we couldn't finish, but I was trying to fit as much as possible in this presentation. Okay? Yeah. So thanks. Nice to see you all today. Uh, my name is Sarah Allen. I'm the uh, dairy specialist here at UNH, or I'm used to saying here at UNH, down at UNH. Um, I'm going to have to stand back here a little bit so that I can see everything. But uh, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about mycotoxins. <clears throat> Sorry about mycotoxins. So I'm a dairy nutritionist by training. Uh, so I like to say that I know a lot about the forage once it's out of the field and how it affects the animals. So I know a little bit about it in the field. I tend to not give a ton of recommendations because I know enough to give you some really bad recommendations. So we're going to be talking mostly about mycotoxin management once you've already got the feed out of the field. Maybe. Well, it was working a second ago. There we go. So hopefully we all have at least heard of mycotoxins, probably had some samples done at some point, um, but these are secondary metabolites of molds. And the reason that we care about them is because they potentially be carcinogenic or toxigenic. Um, so we're really worried about the effects that they have on our animals. We often find them in our grains and commodities that we use on uh, livestock. So all, most of our dairy feeds have the potential to have some type of mycotoxin contamination. And we started worrying about them a lot because they have a lot of uh, detrimental effects on human health, but we also are concerned about them for our animals as well. So we don't want to lose production. We don't want to make our animals sick. And so we really want to worry about um, the mycotoxin content of our feeds. So molds can happen both when the crop is in the field and also once it's out of the field. We tend to call them like storage or um, like field mycotoxins. Those are kind of labels that we give them because um, that's whenever that particular mold is most common. That doesn't mean that they can't happen during both. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But one of the things that we also say a lot of times about mycotoxins is that just because you have mold doesn't mean that a toxin is present. Um, molds produce these toxins, but the toxin is actually like a defense response for the mold. Um, so just because you see mold doesn't mean that there are toxins. And also just because you don't, don't see mold does not mean that there are not mycotoxins. Sometimes there's no visible mold, but there's enough of it uh, that you may not see, but there's enough that we can still have a mycotoxin problem. So they're a little bit complicated to diagnose sometimes. And the most common species, mold species, that we're usually talking about are Fusarium species, Aspergillus, and Penicillium. So I always put this up here, what causes mold contamination? And the answer is everything. Uh, too little rain, too much rain, too little heat, too much heat. Uh, humidity, anything that can cause stress, bugs, pest management, um, depending on the mold species, anything that stresses that plant can cause mold. And anything that stresses that mold can cause mycotoxins. But each mold is different. There's a 
ton of them. Even just saying those three, those three have a ton of different subgenres and everything that it's, you know, there's a ton of different ranges that that mold particularly prefers. Now we have some conditions that here in Maine and where I'm at New Hampshire um, that tend to cause the most issues. Pest damage being a big one, that's always going to cause stress. And the types of molds that we get here in the Northeast tend to be the molds that have, you know, slightly warmer days in the summer that cool down at night, which is a lot of the time. The thing that usually pushes it over the edge is all the rain, which is why with the trends of weather over the years, we tend to see a little bit warmer period, of time. like we're getting a little bit warmer over time and we're getting a little bit more rain over time. So a lot of times we're seeing a little bit more and more and more of these mycotoxins. Maybe we didn't see them a lot of times in the past, but now they're kind of an everyday occurrence that we know we're probably going to have some issues with in a summer like we had this year. So this is an example of a farm that I worked with uh, quite a bit and still am uh, down in New Hampshire. I think, yeah, yeah. if you can't tell, uh, that's a cornfield. I think it, the worst, it was about nine feet underwater. It's no longer a cornfield. Uh, it didn't make it <laughs> because it stayed that way for weeks. This was probably the worst farm that we had flooding issues. They, you know, planted in the middle of a river valley, which has some of the best soil, but not necessarily the best for flood control. But uh, how many people really get to pick their perfect ideal location for, uh, you know, their crops, especially whenever in New Hampshire, we are 82% covered in trees and already fighting for space for our houses. You don't always get the best choice whenever it comes to field. So you plant where you can, right? It takes a lot of feed to feed cows. So sometimes this is what happens. And, you know, the temperatures that we talked about are the reasons why this area up here is what we call mycotoxin alley. I did a presentation, actually, most of this was from that presentation with uh, John Winchell uh, from Alltech. He does a ton of work with mycotoxins. So there's, I think, two slides that I stole from him. But these are samples that he took um, all across the country. And the red is showing the high risk for toxins. So green, pretty good. Red, very high risk. And we have a lot of that in this area. It's a lot of it because of the type of crops that we can grow, but also the weather conditions. And so this was, I believe these were TMR samples. Um, so just kind of showing the same thing. Of the TMR samples from you know, this region, 62% of them had high risk for toxin issues. So we have, this is a, this is a reoccurring issue that we're gonna have to learn to manage if we haven't already. So I'm gonna kind of go through a little bit of the you know, species. Fusarium is the one that we hear about a lot. We call this one a field fungi meaning that most of the time you can see it in the field. Most of the time the mold is going to develop in the field. That's not to say that it can't develop in the bunk, but most often it's going to develop in the field. Typically you'll see this as like a pink or white color. This is a uh, kind of a small example of it. You're not always going to see it, like I said, but you, you can. Um, the common mycotoxins that we deal with, or I thought I'd change this, but I always like to say deoxynevalanone. It's actually deoxynevalanol. That's just my mind going that way, but, um, we also call it Dawn. That's probably the one that you've seen the most. You've heard a lot about Dawn probably. We call it vomitoxin as well because it makes pigs vomit. So not our cows, but you know, we like to name things fun. Uh, we like to name fun things. Um, you can also get mnemonicins and Zeralinone. Has anyone had issues with Zeralinone in here before? Yeah, I've seen a bunch of Yeah, okay. Yeah. If you haven't, you're lucky because Zeralinone, Zeralinone Zeralinone is not a fun one. We'll talk about it a little bit later, but a lot of people haven't had issues yet, but we, we do still get it in the Northeast quite a bit. So this is one that we don't deal with a ton, but where I grew up in the Southeast, uh, we dealt with this one most of all, Aspergillus. Um, Aspergillus, we don't see a bunch up here because it likes really hot weather. And as miserable as it is without air conditioning up in New Hampshire, and I don't know the air conditioning status of Maine, but it's probably worse. Uh, it's still not quite hot enough for aspergillus. But if you have an aspergillus issue, usually up here, it's going to come from an unseasonably hot summer, or maybe you had a really good deal and a great supplier in the Midwest or the Southeast that uh, gave you a good corn crop. That's where I saw it whenever I worked in New York. Uh, somebody had bought some corn from a local farm that they were you know, partnered with down in the Southwest, and they ended up with a bunch of aflatoxin on their farm. Aflatoxin is a major issue um, because if it's found in the milk, uh, you can't sell that milk. 
You can also see um, aquatoxin A and patulin. Those tend to not be, even though some of them are really toxic, those tend to not be the ones that we worry about as much just because aflatoxin is worse. In penicillium, we don't see a ton of here, but they see it across the pond a lot more because it's even cooler and wetter than it is here. So this may be something that we see more of, but this is also, again, another storage fungi. Doesn't mean that, you know, it can't happen in the field, just what's more common. This one tends to be more blue or green and uh, aquatoxin A is most common as well as patulin. And also most of these can also produce other forms of this. That's just like aflatoxin can be produced by penicillium as well. It's just less common. So there's, you know, a lot of flexibility with these because a lot of these are generalizations. So I did my master's work in aflatoxin, so I always had to put it up here, but I'm not going to talk too much about it since we don't really deal with it. But the reason that if you ever have an issue with it, it's a major problem because 0.5 parts per, uh, parts per, actually it's supposed to be parts per billion. I, that's incorrect, but 0.5 parts per billion is what's allowed in milk. And that is a tiny, tiny, tiny amount. And the only reason that it's even that high is because whenever they set those limits, that's slow test would go. So if you ever have an issue, um, it's going to be a serious problem to try and figure out where it came from. And these are just kind of for your references, just because that's what's the uh, limit that we talk about for dairy. Doesn't mean that it's the same for every species um, or for, so if you're selling feed, then your legal limit or your you know, recommendation may be different because every animal processes toxins a little bit differently. So those are, you'll see a couple of these uh, kind of tables. Those are just kind of for you to know. Yeah. Does this get concentrated in distilled grain? It can. I mean, that's... Yeah. Don is what we. It can. They they are pretty strict on aflatoxin testing, especially anything that's going for humans, which distillers originally was right. So, um, they're pretty strict on the testing. And aflatoxin is unique compared to other mycotoxins because for other toxins, if you have a load that's really high in toxins, then you can mix it with one that's pretty that's pretty low. You can't do that with aflatoxin because aflatoxin has been known to kill people. Um, aflatoxin causes liver cirrhosis and liver cancer, which because of uh, not knowing this, whenever I was working with it for years, I always say I'm probably gonna die by 35 from liver cancer, but. So if you have xeralinone, and this is a risk for Maine farmers. If you have xeralinone, again, this is most likely from fusarium. Um, in ruminants, we really worry about it because of the way it's metabolized. Um, it can cause estrogenic activity, meaning that um, you might see like some swelling um, of any of the reproductive glands. Abortions are the ones that you see whenever you have a lot of issues, particularly in heifers. Heifer mammary gland enlargements, so you'll start seeing the udder bag up um, and infertility. So if your repro goes out of whack, we call xeralinone like the repro mycotoxin. It's not a bad idea to check and see if you have xeralinone. So this fancy word up here, trichothecenes, just means that we're talking about either T2 or Dawn. Um, so Dawn again, is also called vomitoxin. I kind of list all of these up here because depending on the test you get or who you're talking to, they'll call them all different things. Um, so Dawn uh, tends to cause immunosuppression, meaning that it's going to affect the animal's immune system. She may be susceptible to other things. I was working with a farm in New York. We kept having a lot of pneumonia in the adult cows, and they were just like, dropping like flies, like three or four a day. It was a pretty big farm. We couldn't figure out what was going on. The vet couldn't figure out what was going on. And this was the first year that they decided to not buy corn grain, but to grow it themselves. We tested the corn grain, came back completely fine. And I'll talk about a little bit of that later. We tested it again about two weeks later, and it was loaded with Dawn. The problem with the pneumonia started with Dawn because it suppressed their immune system. They couldn't fight off infections. Yeah. Will that immunosuppression show up on a tighter as your vaccination is not working? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I've never heard it. Yeah. <laughs> I've never heard anybody talk about it, but that doesn't mean that that just could be no one's thought about it or done it. Um, yeah. Not. Yeah. <laughs> Don't play yourself short. <laughs> Um, we also say things like Dawn is an indicator for other mycotoxins. So if you get a test back and you've got Dawn, you've got other toxins. And it's not necessarily that Dawn causes other toxins. It's just that the conditions that produce Dawn are really favorable for mycotoxin growth. 
meaning that you've probably had some other issues too. So, and, and Dawn tends to be in higher concentrations than some of the others, so a lot of times it's easier to find. So again, just some recommendations depending on who you're selling to. If you're selling any grain to anybody, then, uh, you know, whatever, whoever your, you know, target audience is, that's kind of where you should be uh, looking at. So fumonisins, we can have uh, here. We don't see them quite as often as Dawn, but that's because sometimes they're a little bit harder to pick up. Um, so a lot of times you'll see things like fumonisin B1, B2, B3, aflatoxin A1, B1, G1. Those are just different types. So fumonisin B1 is the most common one that you'll see. We care about this one because it's carcinogenic. We don't like cancer. It's not a great thing. So we try to avoid it as much as possible. In our animals, we're most likely going to see reduced intake and in animal performance. That's something that you'll see for almost all of these. Some type of immunosuppression. Maybe they go off feed. They're not milking quite as well. Depending on them, sometimes the fat test tanks. But fumonisin is different because we actually see an increase in somatic cell count typically. Most of these don't actually show up in the cell count. But fumonisin is a little bit unique. Um, again, this one causes liver, liver damage as well. And so again, some more guidelines. Anytime you get a toxin report back, they'll show you kind of the guidelines that they recommend. They're sometimes stricter than the, than the FDA. So I don't like to, uh, you know, harp too much on the FDAs unless it's a actual like legal restriction like aflatoxin. And if you have any other issues or maybe you get a toxin report that has some weird toxin that we didn't talk about today or maybe a less uh, common one, a North Carolina State Extension, uh, I say this because I wrote it, so I know it's there, <laughs> has a bunch of articles about it. One of them is just kind of a general guide to mycotoxins, gives you kind of a brief overview. A lot of the same information that you've got here on these slides, except in paragraph form. So whichever one you like to read more. Um, but they also have these tables that you can click on, like ocrotoxin A, and it'll take you to a whole you know, section about what you need to know about ocrotoxin A. So if all of a sudden you've got an ocrotoxin problem, Check out NC State Extension and see if it's on that list. If it's not, it's probably time to email somebody because it's a little bit of a weird one. So, I also talk about ergot alkaloids. Um, they're not, they're kind of a mycotoxin, not really. We don't deal with them as, at least from my understanding, I've only been uh, in New Hampshire for a year, but you don't deal with them a ton up here. This is more an issue with the beef guys in the Southeast that are feeding a lot of fescue and they don't manage it super well, so it gets seed heads, but they kind of act similarly with animals. So, I always keep it on the list just in case anybody is feeding fescue, but. And again, wild yeast is not really a mycotoxin, but you can't really talk about mycotoxin without talking about the other issues uh, in your silo as far as like molds and yeast. The thing with wild yeast is it requires oxygen and carbohydrates. Hopefully our silos don't have a ton of oxygen. So we don't always see it whenever we're packing if we did it well, but it does have a lot of carbs. And the issue with yeast is that yeast becomes dormant when it's ensiled but it's gonna wake up when oxygen is reintroduced. And the fun thing about yeast, if you call it that, is that yeast counts can double every two hours under the right conditions. Meaning that if you take your yeast sample at the bunk and maybe you feed once a day or even twice a day, if you got a lot of time, right? Feed twice a day in 12 hours, that's doubled times six. If I can math correctly. Um, so basically it's gonna get worse throughout the day. Your sample at the bunk is not what your cows are exposed to. And what did I just do? This is why I, no one should ever give me a clicker. I like to talk with my hands too much, so. Okay, yes. So if you've got a wild yeast problem, most likely you can smell it. it smells like yeast. Yeast is a pretty recognizable smell. Um, but you'll see your cows reduce intake. The NDF digestibility goes down, milk and fat production goes down. The kicker here that diagnoses is that fat production will tank. You may think that your cows are not capable of making a fat test that low, but they are if they have wild yeast. Um, you also see some digestive onsets and inconsistent manure. So you've got loose manure out there. Some of them are pretty stiff, some of them are really loose. Fat, uh, fat production's gone down and the mold or in your forage smells yeasty, probably is yeast. And all of this can again cause potential health issues, not only because you're messing with her, but all of this stuff is happening at once, which means that she's, her body's dealing with a lot, can't fight off infections quite as well. So our ruminants can tolerate a lot and they can tolerate mycotoxins a lot better than under other animals. But depending on the mycotoxin type, 
and the load, that may be enough to tip the scales where you have a problem. But maybe you don't even have that bad of an issue, but you have not the best feed bunk management. You know, maybe it's sitting out there a little bit too long. Maybe we're not pushing up. Maybe we're not pulling enough off of the face. We don't have the best cow comfort. The stalls really should have been cleaned a couple days ago, and we tend to go a little bit long every time. If we notice our cows are slug feeding, transition period management's not quite where we want it to be, you know, life. In New York, this one was a big issue, stocking density. Our cows were overstocked, kind of goes with the slug feeding a little bit. Anything that stresses that cow can cause all of this to topple. Stress affects the immune system. Anything that's affecting the immune system, all of this is related. So there's no, you know, one number recommendation to stay under, it's all dependent. So I love it whenever consultants say it's farm dependent. <laughs> and when that happens, all of this can happen. We can get laminitis, skin lesions, milk production, you know, changes, um, anything to do with like altering the butter fat, altering, you know, mass or increased mastitis. Everything can be affected by these mycotoxins, which is why they can be one really hard to diagnose. And uh, sometimes your nutritionist really loves to blame everything on mycotoxins. I know this because I was a nutritionist. So. And the really fun thing about mycotoxins, since there hasn't been enough fun today, is that not only do these toxins, you know, have bad effects on their own, but they are also additive with others. Remember whenever I said you most likely have Dawn, it's a really common one here. If you have Dawn, you probably have others. Well, Dawn has additive effects with all of these mycotoxins basically. Right, they all kind of work together. And they also have synergistic effects, meaning that if you have two, you don't just have those two at the concentration that you see them on a paper, the effects of them are worse and they work really well together. Um, so analyzing toxin reports is kind of an art form or I try to make it pretty simple and err on the side of safety. And we'll talk about that in a minute as well. So one talked about this a lot, so I'm not really gonna go into the ensiling process, but Basically, anything that we can do to drop that pH as quickly as possible, it's going to reduce the amount of oxygen. Oxygen is our enemy whenever we talk about silage. We want to get that silage as stable as possible. Um, so ensuring good packing recommendations. Um, I know, I think one I agreed on this one, but 14 is the minimum. I like to try and get my farms to 16 at the, at the minimum for me. If you can get it higher, great. A lot of times somewhere they're usually in that 15 range and we're just trying to get them to 16 first. Dry matter top length, we're not going to go into a ton of that, but believe it or not, I've worked with farms that have, still don't cover their silo. Why? I'm not sure. Um, if you don't cover your silo, not only are you looking at all of these issues, but also a lot of dry matter loss, more than 25%. I don't know who has that much feed to lose, but apparently some people do. Um, if you have one layer, uh, one polyethylene layer, you have more dry matter loss, better return on investment. Um, if you add an oxygen barrier, you're going to have less dry matter loss. Your return on investment is not quite as high just because those can be expensive. So, you know, whichever, how, however your feed storage situation is looking up, those are kind of your, your best options. And also considering a silage inoculate, it's going to help drop that pH and get oxygen out as quick as possible. So, you know, years like this, mycotoxin risk years, warm days, cool nights, lots of rain perfect conditions for mycotoxins. I like to tell my farms to use the rule of 800. So your tractor weight divided by 800 is the amount of tons that you can fill your bunk per hour. In years like this, I tell people to increase their corn silage cutting height. That's because all of that silt, all of that, you know, mud and gunk is ash. And ash is a bunch of minerals. We feed minerals to our cows, um, one, because they need them, but also some of them are buffers in the rumen. Buffers mean that we don't get acidosis, but they also mean that the pH in the bunk is not going to drop as fast. So raising the cutting height, usually 16 to 18 inches, is going to reduce the amount of, you know, ash that's in there because you don't have all of that mud and gunk layer. I've seen some samples from the Midwest that are as high as like 22% ash. That's not going to ferment very well. Um, normally, I don't always see the benefit of an inoculant in forage unless we really have issues with our bunk management or in our corn silage, sorry. Um, just because corn silage ferments pretty well, it's got a lot of starch. Uh, but in years like this where we're really concerned about 
one, reducing our dry matter loss because a lot of my New Hampshire farms lost quite a bit of their fields. And two, mycotoxins. Um, I've recommended an inoculant. You can also consider adding salt to the top layer to reduce spoilage. Um, grasses and legumes, I always recommend an inoculant. They don't have that amount of starch. They don't ferment quite as well. So I like to help them out. Um, but we can't really cut them higher. It's not super practical. So really the best strategy is just to make sure that you get an inoculant in there. Um, so whenever we consider management past that, I always say to feed a mycotoxin binder. That can change depending on kind of your base level versus whenever you actually have major issues, but you should always have a mycotoxin binder in your diet. There are some really cheap ones out there. There's no reason that should not be the one that gets cut. And in years like this in particular, um, you need to make sure you're vaccinated against Clostridia. Nothing to do with mycotoxins, um, but all of that dirt is just Clostridia waiting to happen. And if you get Clostridia in your herd, you don't really know about it until your animals are dead. So, so the other fun thing about mycotoxins since again, there's been so so little fun today, um, is that they don't grow uniform. So how many people have you know opened up their bread bag and it's been a little moldy? If you're like me, you most likely just you know pick off the piece and because it's not the entire piece of bread, right? There's still enough to salvage. Mold doesn't grow uniform; it grows in hot spots, which means that whenever you're taking a feed sample, you may not bite into the moldy piece. So it's really, this, the tests that analyze for mycotoxins are really, really accurate. 0.5 parts per billion accurate. But sampling is very difficult. To give you an example, this, I'm going to show you a ridiculous way to sample, but it's how it needs to be done. I did what you're about to see in a controlled research environment where I knew exactly how much toxin was in there. To give you an idea, it was 300 parts per billion. I got sample results back that ranged from zero to over 10,000 in the same in the same thing that I after I do what I'm going to show you what to do. So it's very, very difficult. If you read a mycotoxin paper, they will almost never show you the feed analysis because it would not get past a reviewer. And most of our farms are not perfect, you know, research environments that we know exactly what we put in there. They're real life. So I always say sample at the TMR. It gives you the values at the cow level. It's also going to be the most mixed sample that you can possibly get on your farm. You can always further investigate later if you're trying to figure out where it came from, but at least you know that you have an issue if you get it in the TMR. So you're going to take a big feed sample, huh? The TMR, the total mixed ration. So you're going to take a big feed sample. You're going to grab, uh, you know, handfuls of feed all across the bunk, and you're going to get it onto a flat surface. You divide it into fours. Then you move one side across, one side across, and keep kind of piling on top of each other. And you got to do that three times. That's a lot of work for a feed sample, but you got to get a representative sample. You got to make sure it's as mixed as it can possibly be. And then once you do that, to actually take a sample, again, you do the dividing and force. This is kind of how you test grain as well. And then you take a sample from opposite ends. Or you, you tell your nutritionist to do that. That's usually what they're there for. So, okay, so if you're working with farms mm -hmm. or if you are a farm that's only feeding silage, that's so hard. Then, yeah, so maybe running it, probably either small or perhaps maybe running it through a blender. If you can. Okay. The, like an pulp, yeah, the worst so thing that happens. Pulp, so, okay. with, a, with a hay probe. Sure. Yeah. You can get, you just got to make sure you can't, whenever we take like digestibility or something, or just a regular feed sample, we're getting just enough hay probes to put it in a bag. Yep. You've got to take a lot more and do all of the mixing. I know. It's a lot of fun. It's never fun. The worst thing that you can do, and this is what people regularly do, and I'm, you know, guilty of it too. You happen to show up on the farm and it's, you know, they don't have the mixed silage down on the bottom and, and you know, I just go up to the bunk and you grab a handful here and you grab a handful down here and you grab a handful over here and you try and mix it really well. But, and that can kind of work for, you know, just getting your feed sample to know how to feed them because you probably take another sample not too long ago anyways. But with this, because of the way it grows, we want to give ourselves the best shot of testing it. And these mycotoxin tests are not cheap. They're not, you know, you can get a feed sample, an IR feed sample for as low as like $20 and they'll give you even some minerals. So these aren't quite as cheap as that. So we want to make sure we give ourselves the best shot. And some of these come back in like two days and some of them can take like two weeks. 
So we don't wanna have to redo that five times. So here's an example of a mycotoxin report. This one, I believe is Rock River Lab. So, you know, this one tried to be more interactive. They got like a target here. Green means you're in the good. Yellow means that you're a little bit at risk. Red means, uh oh, we got a problem. But the way that I look at these is I've got four things that tested positive. Three, none of them are in the red. Oh, wait, actually, there is. Is that a fly? Is that, never mind. It's like, man, I've been saying this wrong for a hot minute now. Um, so, none of them are in the red. So, we're not at risk, except we've got four that tested positive. And remember that giant circle that had a bunch of like, you know, letters on it? All of those were showing that these, you know, work together. They've got additive effects and synergistic effects. So I actually think we do have a problem or we're at least at risk of having a problem. So I'm going to keep an eye out on it. And if I, you know, have, I'm having symptoms of toxins, I'm going to treat it as if we've got positive. Also, I just said that it's really hard to sample for toxins. And I just proved that there are some in the bunk. Now, I could have happened to get the sample that was just really high in toxin and we really don't have an issue, but the cost of having mycotoxin issues and reduced production, potential health issues with your animals is always going to be more expensive than a binder. So this is another example of one from Cumberland Valley. All of these are gonna have some type of recommendations. Your most basic mycotoxin sample will always have aflatoxin, seralinone, and DON, or deoxynevalanol. They may show up as trichothecenes, but this one breaks them down. I believe deoxynevalanol is there and T2 is there. I can see correctly. Um, but again, none of these are in the, you know, red, uh-oh, we have an issue range. I believe, if I remember correctly, I can't actually see the numbers, but I believe all of those are below the recommendations in the table. That's five things that showed up. That's how I look at them. That's how I recommend people look at them, especially if they're having symptoms. So whenever you actually have bad silage, it's a bad year, we did everything we can, but it just, it's not gonna be the best year for it. Can we fix it? Kind of stuck with it for the year. That's our feed for the year, unless we have a ton of money to buy new feed, but we can try and manage around it. Can't fix it, but we can manage around it. If you've got good silage, and bad silage. Usually this happens more in haylage. We've got some bad cuttings and good cuttings. We can dilute the, you know, the bad stuff with the good stuff. Dilution is the solution to pollution. We can also target feed. So maybe don't give this to our fresh cows or our highest producers. And if we know we've got zoralinone, definitely don't give it to our heifers or any animal that's trying to get bred or early in pregnancy because abortions and reproductive issues are a problem with that. We can also feed products that promote uh, or feed products and diets that promote gut health. And the most common one is feed a toxin binder. So speaking of toxin binders, they have a lot of fancy names. Normally these, the most common type is alumina silicate clays. Clays are really porous, they're really absorbent. They like to bind to things. The goal of feeding a clay is that the toxin binds to the clay and it never actually gets absorbed into the cow. It just goes out into your manure pit. They'll have a bunch of names. Uh, this one would be hydrated sodium calcium alumina silicate or calcium montmerlinite. That is almost completely useless up here because it really only works on aflatoxin. Bentonites or just regular Montmerlinites tend to work pretty well on our Fumonisin species, which would be the Dawn and stuff that we have up here. You'll also see zeolites. Again, those are also pretty, pretty common up here. The issue with alumina silicate clays is that very few of them do anything for Zoralinone, which is one of our problem childs. Yeast cell walls um, are also one of the names that you'll hear. Sometimes they do nothing. Sometimes they work really well. And sometimes yeast cell walls bind really well to Zoralinone. Depends on the brand, depends on the dose. The thing that I tell people about binders, because most commercial binders are not just one of these things, they're some combination, because they want to be able to feed it to every region and, and have you know, a general recommended dose so that their, you know, their sales rep can go out no matter where they're at and feed one product. So they're usually some combination, but I always say that you should always be able to ask for research or tell your nutritionist that it should actually work. They should have done studies. They should have actual research that shows that these bind to the toxins that we're talking about, or at least the ones that we know tend to bind really well. So few monocins, things like that. 